Welcome to the grand finals of the World's Universities Debating Championship 2016. I'd like to congratulate all four teams for making it this far, and I'd like to introduce them to you. In opening government, we have Harvard A. In opening opposition, we have Sydney Union B. In closing government, we have Pep A. And in closing opposition, we have Hart House A. My name is Tasneem Ilyas, and I have with me a wonderful panel of Mr. Udayan Mukherjee, Sebastian Templeton, Madeline Schultz, Michael Shapira, Buzz Klinger, Duncan Crow. Said Sadiq and Shira Al Mele. The motion for tonight's grand final is this house believes that the world's poor would be justified in pursuing complete Marxist revolution. I'd like to start the debate by calling our Prime Minister to deliver their speech. Here you are. <laughs> Madam Chair, the global poor all around the world, and no matter what country in which they live, currently live in a system of dictatorship. They live under a dictatorship known as no alternatives, shackled by capital that's been unjustly acquired, constrained by landed gentry who have no incentives but to pursue their own interests, and chained by the fact that they can't do anything but to look at the question of their own subsistence. They're unable to reach out for the right to liberty and to self-determination that we think inheres in the human condition. How are we going to define a Marxist revolution in this debate? We say that in all its forms, it shares the feature of wanting to break down the system of private property. That's what a Marxist revolution means. It can take place in one of two ways. One is it can happen through internal systems that exist presently. That is to say that you vote in Marxist governments who support things like mass redistribution and the abolishment of private property, or it can exist externally in the instance of forcibly bringing down governments that for far too long have tread on these people's rights. The first thing that I'm going to note, just on account of the model, is just a picture of what we think this world looks like. That is to say, we accept that this, won't, uh, this uh, attempt at revolution won't succeed in all instances, that in many instances it'll just lead to the rise of Marxist parties, but in the world in which we do succeed, we encourage you to use your imagination. That is to say, just notice how chronocentric our vision of civilization is. That is, a system of private property emerged out of the Enlightenment. That is the last 300 years of human existence. Prior to that, people lived in sharing economies where they defined themselves as something greater than their labor and their productive force. That's the kind of world that we support. Two things, then, I'm going to begin this speech with. First, Private property constitutes a fundamental assault in human dignity in three key respects. 
First, it is found and it has been acquired unjustly. In the vast majority of instances, the reason why wealthy countries are wealthy is through processes like colonialism, through slavery, through patriarchy. It represents plunder when you refuse to give any representation or resources to whom, uh, from whom you took money. But even if it wasn't in those direct instances of theft, in many instances it was negligence. That's to say the creation of vastly constrictive intellectual property rates. That means that individuals don't, in the poor, have proper access to things like medication. It's refusal to tax properly. We think negligence is just as morally culpable. The fact that it is unjustly acquired in and of itself gives the poor a claim to that property and to, the, uh, and to a institution that is itself been harmful. The second thing it enables the poor in terms of a principle is that it allows them to get redress in, a, in opposition to centuries of disenfranchisement. That is to say, theft and negligence represent the stripping of the individual right to assert themselves. We're going to give you systematic reasons why you don't get reforms on their side, but notice that this as a principled argument is independent from a consideration of practices. That's to say, compensation or giving more money is unlawful like categorically what these people require in principle, which is a redress from the fact that they've been taken out of the system of moral equality by theft and negligence. The last thing to say is let's take them at their best. That is, let's, let's wipe the slate, clean, uh, uh, the slate clean and accept that everybody has equal access to resources. Why then is property still oppressive and why does it represent a, 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 an assault on human dignity? The first reason is that competition and the premises on which it is based is artificial. That's to say it trades on morally insignificant or arbitrary factors. The fact of scarcity, which allows many corporations to succeed. The fact that I was born with certain talents or certain skills that other individuals weren't, we think those are morally arbitrary from the, fa uh, from the consideration of desert, and we don't think that's just grounds. The second thing is a question of actors. So capital continues to decide what begets it. So you get to decide as the head of a corporation who you hire and what kind of skills you have. Principally, private property assaults dignity. This second leads to good outcomes. Notice what, on the other side, they, the reason why they need to defend the status quo is that they don't get the levers of structural reforms that you require. There are three reasons for this. The first is the democratic system, that through processes of gerrymandering which are almost irrevocable in very many parts of the world, the poor are systematically disenfranchised. They don't control hegemonic media that control uh, media narratives about what good policy is. They're usually kept apart by racist rhetoric that accentuates other ascriptive descriptions preventing them from coming forward. The fact of historical disenfranchisement, furthermore, means that they're li less likely to turn out the vote in a way that other people are. The second reason why you don't get structural reform is because it's internationally imbalanced on the considerations of nations. So the Bretton Woods institutions largely built by the West, the institution of human rights, which favors civil and political rights over socioeconomic human rights. We say that those things mean that the alternative they need to defend is continued and systematic inaction. What do you get under our side? One, the success cases. These are the ones in which the revolution works. Closing, I'll take you if you have something. Opening. Despite this rhetoric, the last two decades have seen almost a billion people lifted out of poverty in Asia because private companies have an incentive to unlock an unskilled and uneducated workforce that they otherwise wouldn't. Uh we refuse that premise. The reason why we were able to get socioeconomic rights in countries like China is through massive systems of redistribution and bringing up the poor from the public. So if you want to claim literally the communist country for your side, that is to say the people who've put it together the single biggest program of economic and social rights. Yeah, okay, I think enough said. So let's say the world, the world in which they succeed. We think that those communities will succeed for three reasons. First, it encompasses the vast majority of the global population. It, it, and, and given that capital is dependent on labor to get any returns from it, we think that's beneficial. Second is the location of resources in many parts of the developing world means that they have access to those things. The third thing to say is that you get cross pollination and you get global solidarity across racial lines where currently capital has the incentive to get them, uh, to get them divided.
Those deals with the best case scenario for their side where you get complete revolution. Spinelli will also talk about why you get structural reforms along the way that are beneficial. What we need from an opposition is a comprehensive account of property, why it's just and why it doesn't, as it has continually done throughout history, assault human dignity. We're very proud to propose. Sorry, this will take a second. Panel, ladies and gentlemen, at Opening Government, we say there's a specter that haunts the landed gentry, and that specter is the freedom of the poor who have been systemically excluded from the society that we all should have a right to call our own. Earlier this year in South Africa, a bunch of students, tired of the, like the figure of roads looming over their university, decided, you know, enough is enough, and they said they're going to get rid of this. That led to a movement for the, the requirement and the request of higher education, to which the government said, we simply do not have the money. What they did is they stormed parliament and said you will make it a mandatory requirement because our parents fought for the liberty that we were denied by the apartheid regime. This is precisely the sort of thing we're standing for at opening government. The suggestion that it won't work is absolutely absurd. A number of things in this speech. Firstly, I'm going to talk about the principle and the feeble response we heard um, and then I'm going to talk about pragmatic benefits, right? But before which, I just want to start with two things. One, I want you to ask yourself about a human life. It's such a precious thing and we only only have about 80 years in this world, if at all, when you're lucky. 40 of those years are actually useful. And we spend those years working nine to five jobs, which all of us hate, right? Just to get like 60,000 US dollars if you're very, very lucky at the very best, and you call that freedom. Bo and I reject that this is a realistic way to which individuals have a right to live their life. We think it's absurd that this is the extent to which we like aspire to. We think that that was nonsensical and principally something we haven't heard a justification for. What did we hear in the previous speech? Quickly a mechanistic quibble saying we can't work both within and without the system. Two things. Firstly, he misunderstood Bo. We're very happy to stand for violent mechanisms like this we saw with the roads must fall movement within South Africa. These are literally students who are able to get the government to invest millions of dollars they otherwise said they weren't and take that money out of private property by increasing taxes within that country. Secondly, we think it's totally consistent with it working within the system. Thinking abolishing certain property laws like intellectual property is the sort of thing we're standing for so it can work both within and without the system. On the principle, I'm going to start by telling you just how violent private capital is. The vast majority of the people who are imprisoned in, like, um, in, a, in, in the world's prisons are imprisoned in virtue of crimes where they were trying to get something for themselves. So you were burglaring somebody or that's, uh, that sort of thing. The vast majority of these people are actually poor. So what they're striving for is the bare minimum required for sustenance. And in the developing world, the governments can't provide them with that. The state then, that is supposed to represent all of us, puts these prisons in cages, right? They put these people behind cages. We think that this is never at all justified, and this is the sort of system of enforcement that is required by private property. Secondly, wars of conquest for, for minerals in the vast majority of the circumstances are, in the vast majority of the world are, just, um, are justified on the principle that a pot potential gain would actually justify this war. We think that this violence is the direct assault on human dignity that Bo was talking about. What do we hear in the previous speech? Firstly, and this is important because this is the extent of the, pr uh, the principle argumentation we heard out of opening opposition this is a principal debate they said in the instance that you fail this amounts to sadism the analogy was the extent of the argument panel you have nothing else there on which to vote why is this problematic Bo and I say 
Self-defense, even when you're guaranteed to fail, is a justified thing to do. So I'm going to give you an example. I'm going to give you an example. In the 19, like at the end of the Holocaust, there was a certain individuals in a Polish ghetto, and they knew that the, um, um, that the German assaulters were coming to get them. Those people had two options. They could just like kind of concede and capitulate because all of them were going to die in any case, or they could pick up their arms and give it their best shot, right? Fight against like the Luftwaffe as they did. We think they were justified in pursuing these means, even if it meant that they were going to fail because the resistance of evil is a good in and of itself. We think that this is the principle we stand for on opening government. We've heard nothing of comparable sophistication in the previous speech. The second thing which he said was a principle argument, but in fact it was just pragmatic arguments, was that like these people aren't cul culpable. Firstly, ask yourself about how the process of the acquisition of private property occurred. It was slavery, it was the industrial revolution, it was the, pr the principle was actually taking people and um, plunder, taking people away from people. So we think that that acquisition was unjustified but secondly they talked about people who want to buy a piece of bread and that sort of thing and that we're going to take money away from them we think their ability to imagine a world outside of the confines of property is severely constrained the only extent to which that is an argument is if you buy the premise that the paradigm we need to operate under is one of private property pragmatic benefits they had a number of things here I'm going to start by telling you why contextually the state of affairs are getting worse for the global poor the aggregate levels of absolute poverty in Africa are worse in, in today than they were in 1960s. Median wages of African-American families approximate apartheid South Africa and the trend is that they're decreasing. The 1% continue to own more and more wealth in society. Why was this? And Bo gave you um, like five pieces of material that weren't responded to, but principally they said two things. One, capital in all instances seeks to exclude and secondly, it seeks to self-propagate. He gave you five reasons why we can't change it from within the system. He told you about where people live. He told you about the media, the collective Collective, active problem, collective action problem, disenfranchisement in the international system that protects private property. To this, all we heard was that unions and democracy will solve. Panel, look at what they're saying in terms of argumentation and compared to the sophistication you heard in Bo's speech. The second thing they wanted to have then was they were talking about, they wanted to bring up the example of Asia. Two sorts of responses here, the Asian tigers. Firstly, we say state-owned capital in many of those circumstances approximates on a balance closer to what we're talking about than what they're talking about. This instance like Singapore, China, while aren't ideal, they're getting closer to the sort of ideal we want. Closing, I, I really encourage you to ask me a question. Uh, you, you honestly think that Singapore more closely approximates Marxist Russia than it does Western liberal democracy? Literally, this is our point. This is our point. This is our point. Our point was this. Our point is this. Yes, the state is acting in a capitalist manner, but the ownership of that is based on a democratic principle which everybody has the potential to benefit from. Yes, it exists under capitalism, but it's an approximation that we think is a step in the right direction, right? The bourgeois element before we get to Marxist utopia. Okay, the on Asia, right? The second thing to say is that we don't think this is freedom at all. When people are dying and burning factories in Bangladesh and they don't have the political enfranchisement to say, hey, this is unacceptable to their government, we don't think democratic representation is something that is at all beneficial. What did we give you then in addition to this? Firstly, we told you they can succeed and this is contrary to their arguments about them having better guns. Three sorts of things. Firstly, the soldiers that man those armies, we think in very many circumstances are the global poor. The vast majority of the draft in the United States happens to be African Americans who have systemically been prejudiced by that government. Secondly, we think that just in virtue of the number of people who are actually poor, if all of them decided tomorrow that to like to follow opening government, Harvard on their way to success, we think would be very successful. Secondly, we think the resources um, happen to be in the places where very poor and capital requires labor for it to be effective panel there's a principle here and an assault on human dignity even if we fail self-defense is justified incredibly proud to propose <laughs> I'd like to thank the speaker for their speech and I'd like to invite our deputy leader of opposition. Opening government were a lot like the movie 300. There was a great leader, he gave a speech about fighting evil and then everyone died. That's really... 
that's really the result of what's going to happen here, and I encourage you all to think a little bit more about that before we go any further. Because the problem they identified was the West holds global capital, holds global power, and in those societies, they're probably not likely to use internal mechanisms to give it up. If their policy succeeds, half of Asia becomes communist, doesn't have any money, what then? Here's the problem. As the, at the point where structural imbalance exists, a Marxist revolution at this point doesn't change that structural imbalance. All it does is condemn millions, billions of people to living in that structural disadvantage. We prefer the status quo. We prefer property. Three things I'll talk about. First, why this is an unfair pursuit of the policy that they talked about. Um, I would encourage you all here to review your notes and get past the bluster of opening government because what they are essentially proposing was a policy that removed the basic agency of all, that told people this is the job that you should do, you should accept it, because you should accept over and above any other ideology the revolutionary consciousness, consciousness within you. It denied people the ability to seek other ideologies like religion, like family, because your basic leader, your basic, uh, the person you served with this, was the state. And that was a global poor that even if we can feel less sorry for everyone who is le relative, re relatively richer, was imposing, pe was imposing pe that on people without anyone's consent. A an agency, by the way, that was the basic premise of our conception of human rights, our, our ability to be an agent in the, in the individual and make choices that weren't subservient to someone, was a premise on which we built all other forms of development, all other forms of improving those people's lives. What, what, what did we hear in response? It was a bit confused. In open, at PM, they didn't really want to use violent mechanisms. In Vanelli's speech, we told, they just told us we're happy to, without giving us an actual justification of why that was the case. Tim gave you a couple of reasons. First is that it did matter what the result was, because this was a very, very high bar if you took up arms. You, do, you doomed people to death, you hurt people, you overthrew uh, established norms that disrupted the daily peaceful lives of people. It did matter, therefore, what the substantive result of this policy would be. We also told you that as, as hard it is, as it is to feel so Sorry for us all in this room, that perhaps when we think about the successful justified revolutions in the past, part of that includes an active dictator who maliciously hurts you. Somewhat in the West, people are dis distanced from this sort of, of suffering, and we're starting to improve that with the, in in with the improvement of global media. These, not necessarily everyone is aware of the impact that they have, and therefore they shouldn't necessarily uh, are justified in violently trying to overthrow those people who have really done nothing wrong wrong, uh, done not that much wrong in a system that has broadly, um, you know, brought them in. When they talk about slavery and those sorts of things, we don't think the amount of agency that the modern participant in the global society has in those sorts of historical policies justifies that sort of violence. But the point that we want to make here is, this is, a, this is a policy that robs people of their basic agency and does require somewhat of a success for them to be justified. It's not good enough for the pursuit of overthrowing evil if the result is destitution and death, Madam, Mr. Madam Madam Speaker, I forgot, sorry. Um, second thing, why this won't succeed and that's bad. The thing that I told you in my introduction is at this point, the West holds a lot of the power. That was the problem that they identified. They needed to fix that. First of all, they wanted to look to informal mechanisms. We're not likely to see much voting from people in the West because relatively, they do hold power. Even if it's uh, populations like the American Afri uh, Amer African American population in the US, it's about relative power, according to them. That means that the only place where informal mechanisms would be even viable in leading to overthrowing Marxist, uh, overthrowing capitalism and private property would be in the third world. My question is like, what then? What happens? Like Vietnam becomes a communist country and then says, Cool. Where's the money? Um, that's what we need to do. And at that point, you're not able to engage. You don't welcome capitalist actors into your state if you're a Marxist state. You're not trading with Western corporations. You're not allowing them to skill your workforce. You're not allowing them to bring in capital and machinery that you don't at the moment have. The second thing is we told you to get buy-in. You actually need to deprive and starve people in the status quo to the point where they're happy to get up and, and, and rebel. That means that you're likely to give up 
incremental changes that are making a difference. They're making a difference in places like China. They're making a difference in Singapore. What was the response in the last 15 seconds of the Deputy Prime Minister? The global poor will marshal. You know, they, they number a higher degree. Woefully unresponsive to the fact that Tim told you it's about weaponry. It's about capital. The West can, can, can go without the labor of the third world for, for, you know, six months a year, but the global poor can't go without the capital and food provisions that the West or, or rich actors in this debate provide us. Finally, Marxism will not succeed in the echo chamber that it exists in as a result of this successful revolution. There aren't work incentives for people to help each other. It suffers from the same human greed and same human problems that capitalism does too. The greed of, uh, the greed of getting social power, the greed of getting like, you know, other sorts of power that doesn't necessarily accrue in capital. We think those are likely to be far worse. Before I go on, I'll take closing. The problem is the distribution of that, even in the third world, rather than the absolute amount available. Cool. Well, we think that distribution is improved when you bring in, uh, you know, Western Western sources of technology, ability to, to, to distribute that better. And also, we just don't want people living on subsistence food. What we want is a greater degree of capital and a greater degree of wealth. Why is capitalism improving things at the moment? We told you and gave you factual examples about why that was changing. China, Singapore, India, they were, you know, even if China and Singapore were relatively less, uh, you know, uh, capitalists, they believed in private property, they'd liberalized over the last 20 years. Like, don't even try to win those examples. When we're talking about intellectual property, you have things like generic drugs, and that's because you have an incentive to unlock the workforce in the third world, to gain a group of people that may be incredibly ingenious in how they innovate, in how they work, in how they mechanize. That's why India's had a, a huge booming IT, IT industry that's come out of the fact that the West realized that there is a, a workforce there that they can tap into. Two responses. One was closing government about the mechanized workforce. If indeed, and that's probably true, that is the trend to which global economies and modern economies are going, it's important that we give people the amount of capital they need to then provide things like welfare within the context of a democratic state. If it is a mechanized workforce that we're heading to, the future is probably one that the state facilitates people's leisure time and allows the, the mechanized production to provide. That means we need to get uh, uh, technology to the third world. We need to get capital to the third world for the third world governments to actually then provide uh, a welfare for their citizens. This debate may sound great from opening government, but unfortunately, when we step out of this room and into the Marxist paradise that Bo imagined, we're all screwed. Each I'd like to call a member of opposition. Honorable Speaker, the poor of the world have two choices before them in this debate. The first is to engage in a revolution that will either fail or, more terrifyingly, succeed, or work within the system to improve their influence and their situation within the world, both domestically and internationally today. We will show you how the, the former, sorry, the latter is significantly better. Okay, we're gonna deal firstly with the principle of the debate. Because we get the, the principle that this is what you deserve, it's better to fight uh, even if you are going to fail. Okay. It is principally deplorable to choose an option that will not only condemn millions of global poor to live in a post-revolution society where the people who control the economic and political levers of power are now prejudiced against them, but to subject the poor to economic, political, and violent destruction, right? We think that if you have two choices before you and you choose to endanger the lives of billions of the most endangered people in the world, that is principally abhorrent. So we're gonna take it on that basis, no thank you. Okay. Let's talk about what this revolution happened, or how this revolution looks when it fails. Because they admit that it will fail in almost all countries, right? We're probably talking like the United States, this is going to fail. Europe, this is going to fail. What are the harms of a failed Marxist revolution? It puts the interests of the poor diametrically opposed to the interests of the wealthy. 
This revolution threatens the property rights of the people who have power in society, political power, economic power. It threatens the lives that they have built for their family. It is based on a rhetoric that you don't deserve to have the things that you have, that you feel that you've worked your whole life to obtain, the generations of like wealth that you want to pass on to your children. You threaten to take away everything from the people who have power. This will lead to a, dis like a, a, a hatred or at least an opposition to the poor. Secondly, what will this do uh, to the rich? It will cause them to act in self-defense. So when Mikey talks about the biggest risk, the biggest risk isn't that people lose some stuff. The biggest risk is that this revolution fails and the people who have political power in the developing world turn against the poor domestically and internationally. What does this look like domestically? Look at how tenuous any welfare policy is in the United States currently, right? Like, look at how thin a margin Obamacare passed to give basic medical care to the poor in the United States. The reason that you got this kind of support is on a broad-based rhetoric that the poor deserve our help, right? That their interests are in line with ours, that they deserve help, and that we can help them in this way, right? If you make it such that the poor are a threat to the landed elite, to the politically powerful, to the economically powerful in these countries, those policies will certainly fail. There will also be harms to any form for international support, right? Donations to the, to the, the World Bank, to the United Nations Development Fund, those all depend on development uh, will within the developed countries to give their money to help the poor. If the poor are set to take away everything that they work for and love, that is awful. Okay, so that's if it fails, why it's bad. I'll take front half. On a debate about Marxism, you spent 10 seconds on the principle. Colonialism and slavery were themselves acts of war. Given that the capital was unjustly acquired, disenfranchisement requires reparations, and at best, prop pro property degrades dignity. Okay, there's 15. Okay, look, the poor of the world, if they are made significantly worse off, if they are oppressed violently and economically and politically, will not take solace in your principled victory, right? We are fine to stand on practice here. Okay, next, let's talk about what if it succeeds, which is the real danger in this round, right? Where is it likely that this will succeed? In countries where there is a state that can be overthrown violently, in the places where the poor are the most vulnerable. First, Gov gets up and says Bangladeshi factories are currently very bad. Imagine if the country was thrown into a state of rebellion, what it would be like for these people, both economically and politically. Economically, all investment from the West in the developing world that suffer a violent Marxist revolution will immediately disappear, right? Given that the Marxist revolution will likely fail in where, where the capital is globally, people will withdraw and not have any jobs or investment in these countries, and it will lead to a huge period of economic instability that will take away the livelihood of literally millions of people. This is a serious harm. Next, it will lead to a complete shutdown of government, right? Who pays the police in this state where you have completely disarmed the government and removed them of any sort of legitimacy? Who oversees the electoral mechanism by which this new communist party is brought to power? They give you no reason to believe that a state that is violently converted to Marxism will be a utopia for the poor. In fact, we think that these states will likely lead to incredible perverse incentives for state capture. These kinds of revolutions are usually a very narrow military movement that do not have broad-based public support, right? There's usually one strong militant group in these countries that will take power under the guise of Marxism. Look at the massive Marxist revolutions in South, in South America, and look at how they did not lead to a great redistributive state that helped the poor, right? But instead led to a concentrated military junta or government state that oppressed the poor and its opposition to maintain political power. It is perhaps the most dangerous to give Give these sorts of bodies absolute power over the developing world. It is a narrow movement that will not lead to better outcomes and will in fact disenfranchise the poor and destabilize states that need it the most. Okay, let's talk about our alternative. Why it is better for people to work within the system. How can the poor make things better? We think that there have been huge steps forward in the international system. Things like the World Bank, the WTO, and the United Nations. The United Nations gives literally tons of food aid, millions of tons of food aid to the entire world. And even the World Trade Organization is making huge steps forward. The recent agreement in Nigeria led to an, uh, an agreement to reduce agricultural subsidies from the developed world to the developing world by 65% over the next five years. This is a huge economic win for the developed world. Why is this happening? Firstly, growing social awareness and vocal criticism of oppression of the West of the global poor in the developed world from scholars that come from 
Harvard that say this is bad and we shouldn't oppress people like this. Secondly, growing economic influence of these countries. Regional trade blocs like Mercosur, like the upcoming African Trade Union, are giving a more equal economic footing for the global poor to negotiate equal rights with the global powers, and this is improving their situation. Lastly, domestically, the poor in democratic countries, and even in countries like China that are less democratic, have a substantial ability to pressure their government to do things that are better for them, right? If you have a global poor that is able to unite for a Marxist revolution, clearly they can enact some sort of democratic change to give better policies for them within the countries. It is significantly better. We think that this is not around about machines, right? Like the, the mechanization point I'll spend the last 15 seconds dealing with. Mechanization is not what this round is about. This round is about economic destruction and political disparity for the developing world. We think that if you have principally the choice to lead to growth or deplorable destruction, that the latter is an unprincipled and unjust choice for the global poor. We are proud to oppose. I'd like to thank the speaker for that speech, and I'd like to call our government whip. Self-defense is not self-defense, and it is not justified unless you stand to lose, if you stand to lose more than you stand to gain. What we tell you in closing government is under the status quo, under a capitalist system, the vast majority of people, if not all, st are currently unhappy. And if the worst which that side of the house wants to talk about is some level that you forego some of systemic change of working within the system, that's irrelevant because irrespective, they will still be unhappy, they will still be in a worse condition than they would when you have even the slightest probability of improvement. I want to talk about three things in this speech. Firstly, the principle. Secondly, whether it works. And, and thirdly, what are, what are the potential alternatives? First. On the principle, we hear from closing opposition that self-defense, that the, we hear from closing opposition that we need to care about what happens to the worst of people within society. The premise here seems to be that under the status quo, under their version of the world, they will be in a better position. The first thing I want to note, it is unlikely the world of opening opposition where people are starving is likely to occur. In almost every country, if not every country, you have enough food and you have enough medicine as we've been saying from the start of this debate. The question is instead how it is distributed and that is something which can improve on our side of the house. The question is instead then whether or not you forego more stuff if you don't have the capitalist system in place. But why is that stuff good? Why do you want more stuff? I think there's a couple things to note on this. Firstly, do you even end up with poor people doing well in places like China? That's why Joe dropped the ball when he talked about mechanization. Our point was that mechanization will occur, and that's bad enough in and of itself. It's that someone in China or in the developing world cannot earn more than $3 a day because that's when capital has an incentive to replace that person with a machine, and they become redundant. Opening opposition responded to that by saying, well, if you own the machine, you'll be doing fine. Yes, if you're the capitalist, you'll be doing fine, but we're talking about the worker here. But irrespective of that, we think even if you end up with more stuff, you don't feel happy. Michael explains this and we hear no responses to it. He talks about the feeling of inadequacy, which comes from a system where you identify yourself and you gain your self-conception through consumerism and what you are able to buy, which is often relative to others. How that is amplified by the media and the adverts which exist under the status quo and the lack of agency you have. One note on the lack of agency, which opening opposition seem to care so much about. I just want to highlight the, in the reason why we intuitively think violence is bad is presumably because violence is when you subjugate your body to the wills of another individual. But under a capitalist system, the exact same thing occurs. You have to listen and do what someone else tells you, or you never have the money necessary to survive. That is equally violent, and why violence is justified under our side of the house. 
House. They say that violence from opening opposition must be targeted at the right group. Yes, that is a reason why government assets should be what you attack when you use systems of violence or corporate assets, not an argument against this per se. That is why that side of the House is simply wrong, because the risk-reward basis, if there is any probability of change, we win as long as you believe people's basic needs are met. What do we get from closing on this? It tips the probability of change. They say that what won't ha you won't be successful because the rich will turn against the poor. I just want to draw an analogy here. One of the major reasons the civil rights movement in the United States was successful wasn't because of the kind of incremental steps they talk about. It's instead because the threat of violence which loomed over the ruling class because of groups like the Black Panthers, which made more moderate groups seem moderate and a group you could actually engage with. Why is that relevant here? One of the reasons why you've had improvements in discourse over police brutality isn't just because of a few incidents. It's because you saw violence in Ferguson. You saw violence in Baltimore. But why do people respond to it? Because that is a threat where you know as you as a capitalist have your system of government under threat, the assets you have under threat, and your life potentially under threat. That is when you are far more likely to acquiesce to changes, moderate or otherwise, because you know the consequences for you for not doing so are ridiculously high. It isn't about empathy as that side of the house wants to talk about, which is often piecemeal. Exact example of Obamacare, which still isn't implemented in many, many states with poor people. People, it's because that's piecemeal compared to what you actually get where threat is the motivating factor. But what happens in terms of actual change? I'll talk more about that after anything from opening. Yeah. Capitalism doesn't want people to be uh, illiterate because they can't grow the pie. And at the moment, improvement is occurring through democracy and collectivized structures. Uh, Your Marxist state not only obliterates agency, but you haven't shown why those incentives exist to grow the pie under yours. I mean, we've told you we don't care about growing the pie unless it is equal. That is the point of our case. So let's talk about what could actually happen. So the second, the second thing they tell you is, well, what's the worst thing which could potentially happen? They say this, this revolution to, could succeed. I stand behind opening government where very few of us could ever accurately describe what this system would look like, partly because of the world we live in is so strongly structured by the capitalist expectations we have. I think it is worth noting that it's quite likely any system will be democratic. But I think it's probably unlikely you'll get all-out success. But why can this measure actually work? For several reasons. One, because the problems of the natural order. Many of us simply believe capitalism is natural. The fact that we believe the sun goes up and the sun goes down because most people don't problematize every single aspect because this is structured and supported by myths. Myths like the American dream, which Michael points out, turns collective failure of a society into individual failure, which says the problems of the world are that of the poor's own failing. This is the system of false consciousness. Why does violence or a capitalist revolution, even led by a vanguard, as closing opposition seem to want, end up creating change? In the first place, because that's conscience, consciousness raising. You realize there are problems and people are willing to turn to violence to support it. You, as someone who is poor, who has always considered this to be natural and justified, now can at least problematize that. Secondly, because there's often transmission mechanisms. There were transmission mechanisms back in the Russian Revolution, where you saw what was spreading from Russia into even parts of Germany and the United Kingdom. Similar things will happen at a greater scale now that we live in a world where you end up with more and more media. But thirdly, we think it is fairly important to realize that the vast that you can end up with change. I don't think in most circumstances in the real world that change will be an entire collapse of the system. What it will probably lead to is enough violence that you'll end up having to have some level of change, hopefully a reasonably large level of change on our side of the house. Redistribution and mass redistribution, probably more, uh, more uh, nationalization of the means of production because the threat of you not doing so otherwise when you've, when you've created class consciousness, when you've created a threat of violence is significant. It's for all those reasons we're very happy to propose. I'd like to thank the speaker for their speech and to close the debate, our opposition whip. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I think it's very interesting that Harish says very few of us can accurately describe what this end state will look like.
I think that points to how many of these movements have failed, which is why they don't want to describe the likely outcome of what happens in a Marxist revolution. The state looks nothing like the utopia that the government bench has tried to paint for you. It looks a lot closer to what Joe has described in our extension. I want to talk about three things in this speech. The principle of this debate, the process of arriving at a Marxist state, and the end outcome and which side is better on that. Let's begin with the principle. There's two main principles coming out of the government bench. The first is that private property is inherently unjust because competition is artificial, because private property is often unjustly acquired. There's two problems with this. First, this argument is ultimately hung on the end outcome of the state they're talking about, and here's why. Any sort of system of living together collectively in large states will impede upon the freedom of citizens. The question is, what kind of system best allows for those citizens to pursue the ends they want? At the point where Joe paints you a picture of a state which is susceptible to political capture and is unlikely to lend freedom to its citizens, the very fact that they own property does not mean that their broader freedoms are more accurately respected. Second, even if the end outcome they talk about is desirable, at the point where the process of getting there is negligent, as Joe tells you, that is another reason to oppose the principle they put forward in this debate. The second principle they stand on is self-defense. They say this is akin to acting when your life is in danger. There are two problems with this argument. First, as Joe tells you and expands on in his extension, they greatly exaggerate the threat that the global poor face in a world that is increasingly sensitive to their needs and concerns. Opening opposition talks to you about the fact that some countries have liberalized and lifted people out of poverty as a result. Joe adds many things to this. He talks about the reorientation of international organizations into regional trade blocks that are increasingly sensitive to the needs of the global poor in the poorest parts of the world to mobilize and defend their own rights. He talks to you about the increased criticism of these organizations by academics and increased awareness on social media and other platforms of ways to improve them. But even if you don't buy that, this isn't analogous to self-defense for this reason. Self-defense is justified because the best case outcome of self-defense, living, is better than the status quo, which is likely death. Our extension is that the best case outcome of this policy, a Marxist state, is not better than the status quo. Ultimately, the degree to which you buy their self-defense point also depends on whether or not you think the state they create is better. No, thank you. Let's talk about the process of change. We've told you down the opposition bench this is unlikely to be a successful process. What have they told you in response? The first thing they tell you is that the military is largely comprised of people from lower socioeconomic groups. It is likely to be a successful military revolution. Closing government adds to this and say you create fear among upper classes for losing their wealth, which creates a need to acquiesce to demands. Two things to note here. First, the increased fact that militaries are based on sophisticated technology means that the governments we're talking about will have a very strong ability, predator drones, tanks, etc., come to mind, to crush this revolution irrespective of manpower. Secondly, the demands you're asking of rich people are not ones they're likely to acquiesce to. You're asking for a radical reorganization of the whole state. This is an incredibly maximalist demand that they're unlikely to enter into a process of bartering or negotiation with. But thirdly, and this is the point that no one engages with on their side, apparently in their world, if we were to buy the premise of their case at all, they have this incredible unique opportunity where the entirety of the world's poor are willing to cooperate in Endeavor X. They want Endeavor X to be a Marxist revolution. But Joe tells you if you have this level of cooperation, exerting democratic pressure is a far more sensible way to achieve the changes you want to see. In fact, one might think that a broad-based movement that was advocating for change within the system would represent the example Harish thinks works for their side, namely the civil rights movement in the United States. I think the points they give you for advocating change are incredibly short-sighted. They then talk about mechanization. They say that the first thing to note is mechanization will radically change the way the poor work. It's locked them into earning $3 a day. Two responses. The unstable state Joe paints for you is one where people are denied jobs anyway because the state doesn't have the economic fundamentals or the political stability to allow for economic opportunity. Secondly, I would note that they're kind of hyperbolizing here. The problems they're talking about are some ways away in the future. I don't think revolutions are often based on the specter of threats that are going to arise like 50 to 100 to 150 years from now. But even if that was justified, the third theme of this debate of better outcomes is critical, and I want to talk about that now. I'll take opening. Are in cages because of poverty. 
Are they not principally justified to violently attempt to free themselves even if they fail? How will the WTO help them in that endeavor? No, no, sorry, sorry, sorry. If you think, you can't say that they are going to be justified even if they fail because the outcome is a world where their cage expands and more of them are put within it in a more oppressive system. I simply don't buy that this kind of... Try, try your best is going to work, especially when I've distinguished why self-defense is not an appropriate analogy in this case. Let's talk about better outcomes. Well, the, the first outcome, attempted an outcome from opening government is Finelli doesn't like the fact that we have to work from nine to five. Well, I don't think communist Russia was well known for its comfortable working hours or comfortable hours for laborers in general. And, this, and to speak more seriously, they're talking about people being structurally shut out of systems of power. This is the crux of the government case. People can't access the media. People can't access international organizations. People cannot access global capital. Firstly, for all the reasons Joe expands on to you about, this is getting better. The bar they would need to justify this kind of radical action is incredibly high, and improvements matter. But secondly, he paints for you a picture, a picture of political capture that is crucial. Opening opposition talks to you about the fact briefly that the economics of the state might be bankrupt, but the politics are far more pernicious. At the point where these revolutions tend to be led by narrow groups of people, and these revolutions tend to institute strong men like we've actually seen in South America, the resulting state does not lead to a utopia for the poor. It leads to the entrenchment of revolutionary leaders and the entrenchment of people who have an incentive to concentrate their own power at the risk of the people they are most concerned about in this debate. Closing government wants to talk about the American dream as an incredibly oppressive form of ideology that represents capitalism at its worst. Beyond the fact that this might be unique to exceptional countries like, not very good countries, like exceptional conditions like America, the important thing to note is how have socialist countries traditionally gone about constructing ideology to get people to buy into, the, uh, buy into the fact that these revolutionary leaders will institute equality? They institute far more pernicious systems of social control on their side of the house. They institute systems where political strongmen are able to retain power over vast swaths of the global poor and on the comparative, remove their ability to democratically agitate for the changes that both sides of the house want to see. We beg to oppose.